Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University. Welcome to Vlog 291, Lifelong Learning During a PhD. This vlog comes by request from Vanessa. Hi Vanessa, you are wonderful. And Vanessa wanted me to talk about lifelong learning and the PhD because I've just finished my fourth master's degree and Vanessa wanted to know quite rightly uh, why I had done that. And look, let's do the catalogue. I have, what is it, three bachelor degrees, one with first class honours, one with distinction, the other one was just a past degree. I have two graduate diplomas, I have four master's degrees, and yes, I have a PhD. And I've also done plenty of MOOCs as well. In fact, I finished my fourth master's degree, I think a week ago, and I immediately enrolled in a new MOOC. And also I've gained a certificate from what they call stacking the MOOCs. And when I've stacked the MOOCs, I got a certificate from the University of California, Davis. So I've done more qualifications since I finished my PhD than before it, and I'm aware that's pretty rare. But what I'd say to you is that the world is changing. The notion that a young person would go from school and then do a bachelor degree and then maybe an honours or a capstone, and then do a master's and then do a PhD and then leave, that narrative and that group of people is a minute part of our contemporary university sector. And in fact, it's always been a small group and it's incredibly small now. And let me just give you some stats from the legendary Flinders University. Flinders University, the students in our doctoral program vary from the age of 21 to 93. The average age of a person starting a PhD is 40, and one third of our students are part-time PhD students. So today, therefore, I want to talk about lifelong learning. Now, a PhD can, for some, be part of that lifelong learning journey. Or it could be one stop, and then you return and do other qualifications after the PhD. And in many ways, our world is changing, and this vlog series has tracked a lot of those changes. But I'm going to try and put in place some clear, quick definitions of lifelong learning, and then 10 reasons for you to consider lifelong learning in your lives beyond the PhD. Yeah. So some of you may already have started to shake your head and rock gently from side to side because the idea of doing any learning after a PhD when it's been such a dreadful experience it is actually your worst nightmare. But what I hope to do is to perhaps convince you about the value of lifelong learning, whether it is a two-hour MOOC or even another PhD. And of course, the other odd area that's increasing in higher degrees are the people that are doing two doctorates. In fact, I've had a wonderful colleague uh, email me thinking about doing his third <laughs> doctorate. So as you can see, things are changing. So let's start with lifelong learning and then 10 reasons why you may consider it today, tomorrow, or in your future. Now, lifelong learning has three characteristics. It's ongoing, it's voluntary, and it's self-motivated. Lifelong learning absolutely can enhance your employability and also your professional skills. But it's also something that gives you personal satisfaction. So it can also be part of what significantly is called personal development. So professional development is part of it, so is personal development. Now the first lifelong learning institute emerged in the legendary New School in New York City beginning in 1962. And the New School described its project as, quote, learning in retirement. End of quote. How terrific. And the University of the Third Age continued this goal and around the world. But it started in France because, you know, the University of the Third Age is just tremendous. And as a movement, it began in France in 1972. So this movement, if you will, started with a recalibration, a renegotiation of what is retirement and acknowledging a desire to learn within retirement. Now, that's one strand of lifelong learning, and an incredibly important one. 
Okay. The second strand is a recognition that technological change has been a major area and momentum socially since the 1960s. Wilson's white heat of technology, if you will. So the degree from what, which we graduated has not prepared us for the technological, social or economic transformations that have emerged since we graduated from that first degree. So to continue to remain in the workplace, to continue to gain a living, we need to continue to learn and remain relevant. So finally, lifelong learning is that way to enable personal growth. That is, lifelong learning at any age is a way to develop human potential and the capacity of the person to increase who they are through development. Okay, now universities are now recognising the value of lifelong learning in all these three strands because people are returning to university for degrees but also for certificates and smaller stackable entities as well that we'll talk about in a sec. Or of course they're learning and gaining learning experiences outside of credit of which say the MOOC model is perhaps the best known but its success remains I think still pretty ambivalent. So universities need these new students committed to lifelong learning because there's simply not enough young people leaving school that is required for our economic structures, that's required for our industries to renew the workforce. And therefore, there is and remains a very high correlation between academic credentials and high paying occupations. That correlation is still in place, colleagues. The, the better educated you are, the more money you earn. Okay, so distance education and now of course online education has expanded radically in the last 20 years along with the number of students. We can now work full time and maintain caring responsibilities for children or for elder relations and we can fit the learning in and around our lives. So the old days of 20, 25 years ago where you had to be at 11 a.m. lecture or you had to be at a 3 p.m. tutorial, there's whole suites of learning that are now available that do not involve those types of commitment that are impossible to actualize in a full-time job. Okay, so as work has got harder and all of us are managing one, two, three, four, five different jobs and a huge number of responsibilities, the capacity to learn around our work is absolutely fabulous. So lifelong learning is self-motivated and it requires you to be a self-starter. Now, you might be wanting to learn a new skill, a new language, researching an area that is of interest to you, learning a new activity or learning new technology, software, hardware, where. Now, let's talk about how that lifelong learning operates in and around a PhD. Now, as someone who's done a lot of professional development and indeed delivers a lot of professional development around the world, let's talk about you, the PhD, and lifelong learning. Let's do this. So, Vanessa, I'll make sure all the weird things I've learned through all these degrees are somewhere in the story now. So, okay, lifelong learning, PhD, one. Why would you do it? One, gain interdisciplinary expertise. Now, if the desire to be an academic or a life in the professions is important to you, then further learning outside perhaps of formal learning may be required of you. Most of us start our undergraduate degrees in very traditional disciplines. Now, my first couple of degrees were in a very, very traditional history department old-fashioned history yep but that past was not going to be my future and so while I was doing my research masters in history I did a second bachelor degree in literature and communication okay now can I say in Australia now you are not allowed to do that they do not allow you to enroll in a higher degree and another formal qualification like that so you can't do it but 
I'm so old that the rules weren't in place. Now, this second bachelor degree gave me the interdisciplinarity that I needed. And of course, it infused that research masters with new theory and new ideas. And similarly, when I completed my PhD, I enrolled in a second master's degree at the same time. And of course, this one was done via coursework. Now, I wanted a coursework degree because I wanted to move into a new discipline. And so that Master of Letters qualification was a Master of Letters in Cultural Studies. So why I really enjoyed that uh, coursework Masters is it provided a rational, logical and considered movement into a new area, a new paradigm, a new subject. And that's what I needed at that time. Now, that dissertation from that coursework masters actually gave me three articles in the end. But this expertise in cultural studies improved the PhD, but also paved the way for my future. Now, remember, I speak to you today as the professor of cultural studies. Uh, now, my first job at the Victoria University of Wellington in Aotearoa, New Zealand, was actually a lecturer in history. I taught very traditional history in my first job. So as you can see, this lifelong learning started when I was actually very, very young. And I did it at that time to broaden out my interdisciplinary expertise. It improved my research masters. It improved my PhD. It also pushed me to produce articles from these other dissertations, from these other degrees. And I didn't know I would write them. I wrote them and they added very quickly to my refereed article list. But it also gave me intellectual and employment flexibility, which is my second point. Two, why would you do lifelong learning? Increase the diversity of your career options. Now, lifelong learning is a great way to transcend your home discipline or disciplines. So say you've completed degrees in biology. Well done you. But you may decide, you know what, I'm going to do a certificate in science education or science communication. And I think that's a really good idea. Yes, it's useful intellectually for you, but these additional qualifications may and probably will give your career some depth and some flexibility in troubled times for higher education. So let me show you how this works. So as I've said, my first full-time job was in history. My second job was in media and communication. Then I moved to communication and cultural studies. Then I got my first chair as a professor of media then I got the tenured North American post as the professor of communication. Then the leadership post started to appear. And my first leadership post was as professor and head of photography and creative media. 14 different degree programs. Remarkable experience. But as you can see, all of that seems pretty normal. All those degrees and all those, those jobs are sort of clustered into an area. So it makes sense. But then something weird happened. <laughs> I was made head of school and professor of education. So I was made the head of an education school. In fact, one of the largest school education schools in the country. And then, of course, I became the dean of graduate research. So that's an institutional wide role. And it's very, very tough for women, particularly women from the humanities, to gain any sort of leadership role in research at all. So it's tough to be in a portfolio role. It's very rare for women. And the diversity of the qualifications and my experiences became really the way that I was able to get that job and have credibility in this job. So how did any of this happen? Because you can see the old thing. How did I become head of a school of education and professor of education? And the answer is, team, lifelong learning. There's no doubt if I hadn't completed additional qualifications that those two jobs, my last two jobs, would not have emerged. So when I finished my PhD, so exactly where you are now, when I finished my PhD, I realised <laughs> that the PhD provides absolutely no training for teaching at all. 
and I wanted to be a good teacher. So I enrolled, finished the PhD, and I immediately enrolled in a Bachelor of Education. Now it is, looking back on it now, my favourite degree. I loved doing it. I learned so much. It was brilliant. Had a ball. And educational technology was just becoming a thing. And so I did, in this Bachelor of Education, a course on educational technology. And if you look at my research career, so much of that research career on educational tech comes from that course I did in the Bachelor of Education. And I also did a course on disability in education, using the language of the time, sadly, you know, special education. I loved that deeply. And as you can see, a large chunk of my research career has explored disability and impairment in higher education. So I had the tools that were given to me through this degree. So I learned how to teach. I learned how to teach. But over a decade later, I then took those skills that I gained from that Bachelor of Education and I enrolled in a Master's of Education. Now, the teaching materials weren't great. The materials are pretty dated. But as you know, the dissertation became my the University of Google that made my career. So when a head of school of education job appeared uh, with a professor of education tethered to it, I applied for it. And I got it easily. I got it easily because I had all the other specialist degrees, but I had the bachelor and research masters from education. So at the time, because I was a full professor when I decided to do the research, <laughs> research masters in education, and can I say a lot of people around me thought I was an absolute idiot. Like, why are you doing this? You're an absolute moron. Why are you doing this, Tara? You're mad. And they stopped laughing 10 years later when a door opened to get a fantastic job that would have been closed if I hadn't done that qualification. So as you can see, education is never wasted, but education can also open doors for employment that may be closed for you. So clearly higher education is in absolute chaos at the moment. Uh, you've got no idea, none of us do, what opportunities are gonna be available to you and in what disciplines. Therefore, don't wait for the road to appear in front of you. Don't wait for an opportunity, start to pave a pathway to the road when it appears. Three, why would you do lifelong learning? Because you continue to understand the student experience. Now, this one is incredibly important. There are so many strategic plans, etc., that talk about the student experience, student focus, or student led policy, right? But too often these phrases are thrown about in strategic plans without any content at all. Now, in the old days, 10 years ago, people would finish their degree. And remember, the PhD used to be called the terminating degree, the last degree you do. So people would finish their degree and they would move from the roles, the sociological roles of student to teacher. And they would forget the student experience and they would forget what it feels like to learn, to be frightened, <laughs> to have to negotiate a new platform, a new technological system, having to get an email address. All that stuff gets forgotten. Now, I've actually never left a learning experience. I started kindergarten when I was four, loved kindergarten, started kindergarten when I was four, and I've just finished my fourth master's degree a week ago when I was 52. So I've remained a learner through my entire life. I've remained a student through my entire life. And at my age and with my experience, you know, a professor, a dean, coming into a coursework master's degree, as I've just done, it's been very interesting because it means I can look at the teaching and the curriculum in a very different way. And look, at my age, I can see what's going wrong. I can see what's going wrong with the curriculum, the student interfaces, how experience is substituting for expertise, and I can see very odd teaching and supervisory strategies. So the greatest gift that teachers can give students is to remain students, to remain learners. And if you remain a learner, you're not brittle in your confidence. And wow, we're seeing a lot of that in higher education at the moment, aren't we? So 
Higher education has changed radically, oh my goodness, in the last 20 years. And if academics achieved their last qualification 20 years ago or 25 years ago, they haven't seen at the coalface the changes in learning, the changes in being a student. Now remember, I did a master's during a pandemic. So when my students, our wonderful students at Flinders came and saw me and said, you don't understand what it's like to study during a pandemic. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. And the reason our students have been so successful at Flinders is because I understand how tough it is and we've sat down and we've worked through strategies. So teachers remain learners. Four. Four. Why would you do lifelong learning? So you can understand what is going wrong in higher education. <laughs> yes, completing lifelong learning allows us to remain students and therefore we remain tethered to, if you will, the student experience. But for me, it's also allowed me to see what's gone wrong, what's gone very, very wrong in higher education. Let me explain. Now, one of my favourite books ever written in higher education studies is by Aram and Roxa, and it was titled Academically Adrift, Academically Adrift, published in 2011, and I really recommend it to you. Now, they conducted a longitudinal study where they assessed critical thinking and learning at the start of an undergraduate degree in North America and then carried the study through and tested the students at the end of a North American four-year degree. And the testing at either end of the degree showed that the students didn't learn a lot. <laughs> so they went through all this stuff and they learnt very little. But the, the study was also provocative for other reasons and I've used it a lot the study for other reasons and they are they studied how little the students read through their degree and how little the students wrote through their degree they showed that very little reading was completed each year and very very small short assignments were all that were required now i've done a couple of degrees since that book was published now, originally, one of my graduate diplomas is in gastronomic tourism. Yeah! And originally, I enrolled in a Master's of Gastronomic Tourism. And I ended up graduating with the graduate diploma. And let me tell you why. The first five subjects in gastronomic tourism were absolutely tremendous. Fresh reading, great expectations, innovative assignments. I got a huge number of articles from particularly the first three courses. It was great. Then I did obviously my favourite courses first, as you do in lifelong learning, you do things you're most interested in first. And then I enrolled in a sixth course and it was dreadful. Dated readings, poor assessment, poor teaching. And I was going, what is going on here? It was like going from a really great experience to just sort of troll. It was a nightmare. What's gone on here? And then I saw what happened. And I've seen it happen around the world, in universities around the world. What happened was, someone had a good idea. Gastronomic tourism, yeah, rock and roll. So that's, that's great, let's do that. So they went, let's develop this into a master's course. That's brilliant. But what happened was, they ran out of money. And so they were able to configure a certain number of courses in gastronomic tourism that were edgy and on topic and fantastic. But then they needed to complete the course, have enough courses to make the degree work and so they start to pinch very basic courses from event management and from tourism. So, and of course these generic courses were used for multiple masters throughout the faculty. So that was a way to cheaply complete all the master's degree by having a few courses that slot into everything. Now these courses were taught by casual staff and the courses had not been updated in years. So when it was looking like I was going to have to complete two more courses like this at $3,700 a subject, I decided to exit with a graduate diploma. So what I've learned from this, and I've seen it around the world and I've studied it now, is universities often have one great idea. This is a new course. This is exciting. Let's do this. This is edgy. Let's do this. But they can really fund the whole program. So they're able to create a few subjects, a few units, but don't have the dough or the will or the expertise, perhaps, to complete the job. 
So what this results in is what's often called colleagues around the world, it's called double badging. So we have double or triple badging of a subject. So one subject, particularly in a master's degree, is then used in multiple generic master's degrees to save money and create higher enrollment in fewer units or subjects. So be aware of this problem. If you're going into this, paying this type of coin, ask to see the curriculum and check how often that curriculum is updated. If you are seeing that there's no readings from the last two years, I think you've worked out what's happened there. And then, of course, there is the master's degree that I've just completed, the Masters of Leadership. And this has demonstrated the Aram and Roxa argument better than anything I could have imagined. The courses were so few. Let me tell you what the courses were. An entire master's degree, two courses, a double value dissertation module, and 10 credentials. Okay, that seems innovative. What are the credentials? Well, in a credential, we, I, present our experiences in relation to a particular topic, like our experiences in relation to communication or experience in relation to driving strategic results. Now, of the two courses, two courses in the Coursework Masters, one was okay and one was absolutely dreadful. Now, the okay one introduced leadership models. Okay, that's great. But it featured very little reading. Let me tell you how little reading there was in this uh, unit. I was able to complete the entire reading for the semester in one day. One Saturday, I started reading all the compulsory and elective reading, and I finished the entire semester's reading by the end of the day. It also featured readings that were very old, recycled, 10 years old, so no one had updated the materials again. And the other crazy bit of this story is that the assessment was unbelievably small. 1,000 words, 1,500 words, 2,000 words. So you can see there is the Aram and Roxa argument, right? Very little reading and very little writing. Then the second course, room two, two, second course was an absolute mess. Uh, supposedly it was teaching research methods. It was teaching research methods, research methodology, but it had no mention at all of epistemology or ontology. So what is going on? Quant was managed in one week. Quant. And the assignments, again, were these crazy little 1,500 word, 2,000 word assignments. And the final assignment asked the students to make a video telling the course coordinators how much they learned through the course. Okay, then we get to the dissertation, okay? Double unit dissertation. Now, I'm expecting 30,000 words, maybe 40,000 words, but that's about right for a dissertation. Let me tell you what happened. Instead, in the dissertation model, these little tiny subjects, once more, 2,000 words on a literature review, 2,000 words on research methods and design, and then an 8,000 word dissertation that used the previous assignments on the literature review and research methodology to scaffold into it. And then a final assignment again of 1,500 words reflecting on the process of doing the dissertation. I was horrified. You know, yes, I'll get a refereed article out of the dissertation, but I've always believed in coursework masters. Why this was so horrific for me is I believe and always justified coursework masters. And indeed, the previous coursework masters dissertation that I did was 40,000 words in length, and I got three refereed articles out of it. Now, I looked at what was presented in this masters, and there was so little reading, way, way too little reading and way too much emphasis on experience rather than expertise and reflecting on that experience rather than thinking about knowledge. Okay, now I'm glad I've done it. Did I learn a lot? No. 
did it structure how I will think about leadership in the future? Yes. Did it teach me how to not structure a master's degree? Absolutely. So go into any lifelong learning experience with your eyes open. Ask to see the curriculum and ask to meet with the teachers and look at the assessment so you know what you're getting into. Five, renew self-motivation and build learning communities. Now, lifelong learning requires that you are self-motivated. You are not doing this completely. You might not be doing it at all, but you might be not doing it completely for money. This is not necessarily about money. You're doing this thing to learn. And you're doing this learning to add meaning and context to your life. So in a time of complaining and whinging and blaming others, lifelong learning is quiet. It's peaceful and it's meaningful. And instead of attacking the world and abusing others, instead of doing damage in the world and doing damage to people, which is sort of the daily life of higher education at the moment, you've made a decision to make different choices. You are standing for reading, thinking and learning. And the great gift of lifelong learning, which in many ways comes from the University of the Third Age, I think, for the older crew, is that learning can build learning communities. And in times of isolation, and the pandemic has shown the consequences of that, we can meet new people and share a desire to learn. It's much tougher to meet people the older that we get. You know, our friends, our family die <laughs> or they move away. So learning is a way to fill up our well of ideas, but also meet interesting people and share friendships through learning. Six, future-proof your career and prove your value to your employer. Okay, let's talk about money. There is no doubt that the key criticism of lifelong learning is that it is cheap for employers. Organisations are able to save huge amounts of money by placing the responsibility of learning on employees. So all the qualifications I've done, I have paid for. I have paid for. Now the leadership degree I've just finished cost $19,800. Cost more than just about all the cars I've owned in my entire life, right? And that $19,000 plus came from my salary. So it came from my earnings. So our universities gain a well-qualified workforce. Lifelong learners are able to improve their skills and it costs employers nothing. So in this mode, lifelong learning does blur the relationship between where we learn, school and university, and where we work. It does blur that up a lot because you are improving yourself, absolutely. You are future-proofing your career, which is important, but you're also value-adding to your employer. And very rarely these days will employers pay for you to do that learning. There may be some small budgets for conferences or training days, but now qualifications are incredibly expensive and your employer is not going to pay for these and probably won't even give you time off to complete them. Now, none of my employers have paid for any of my qualifications or indeed provided any time at all. So that's the reality that you've got to confront. Seven, think about what you would like to be able to do right. Now, a crucial reason, reason to enact lifelong learning is skill development. There's something that you need to know how to do that you don't know how to do now. And that's why technology-based lifelong learning is so popular. So if you move through LinkedIn uh, learning offerings, uh, so many of those offerings are in software or in hardware. And there's a reason for that and it is a great motivation to complete lifelong learning programs. Now, I did this earlier in my career, 
as we've talked about, I did a teaching qualification, but I could see, and this was 1997, many of you weren't born, um, I could see in 1997 that distance education that I was working in very strongly with my universities at that time was morphing into online education. And people about my age remember that we were working with that truly appalling system. Do you remember WebCT? I know it's sort of people have to be medicated, but we're using this truly appalling uh, interface called WebCT. And I didn't want to be that woman that didn't know how to use educational technology. You know, I didn't want to be the chick that went, uh, a man will have to do the tech for me because I just can't, because I'm a lady. Look, I just am not prepared to do that. I thought, no, come on Tara, toughen up princess. So I enrolled in 1998 in a graduate diploma of internet studies. And I think I was one of the first groups to actually do this qual. And look, it was great because it took me through the full suite of skill development, training information, literacy, digitization, the whole thing. Structured pathway through the internet. Fantastic. And it also meant I could write my third book, which was called Digital Hemlock. It also meant that I was really one of the very early innovators in online learning and I won a series of teaching awards at the at the turn of the century because of those innovations and to this day I'm very comfortable experimenting with educational technology which of course this vlog series is part of first time in the world anybody's done this we've done this together so as you can see if you need to know how to do something you see a change coming well you know what call it early and be confident. Don't be frightened. Really, don't be frightened for me. Don't. Don't fear the change. Do lifelong learning and get ahead of it. Eight, look at what resources you've got. Look at what resources you've got. So therefore, let's talk money again, right? Formal education right now is unbelievably expensive. Remember, I just got a bit of change out of 20G. <laughs> for the masters that I just did, right? So therefore, work out what you need to be able to do and what resources you have. Now, to be frank with you, I think the best value for lifelong learning on the planet at the moment is probably LinkedIn Learning, I think. It's not a huge commitment of time and money. You can continue to learn in a way that fits around your career and your caring responsibility. So it's all sorts of programs for an hour or two hours. Very, very good. Another great strategy that actually I'm about to consider is doing an annual subscription for Future Learn. And then you get to choose from an array of providers for MOOCs, bless, and get the certificate. And that's always nice. So what's happening now, team, is people are starting to work through micro-credentials. We're hearing that phrase, that word and phrase a lot, micro-credentials. And micro-credentials are enacting a major change in higher education. What's happening, a range of providers, universities plus, a range of providers are creating policies to stack micro-credentials into a certificate or a diploma or a master's. So this means for us, the punters, uh, that the financial outlay is not great at any one time. We can do a bit and do a bit and do a bit and stack them into something. Therefore, we really need to start with what you would like to learn, work out how much or how little you want to spend, and therefore make decisions. And remember that there are still hundreds of thousands of free MOOCs that are available to be audited. So it means you can start today with no cost and just see how you go. Nine, why do lifelong learning? You will live a learning life, not a fearful life. I respect people who undertake lifelong learning and let me tell you why. They make a commitment to continually test themselves. Now, when I look at a CV, and I look at a lot of CVs, when I look at a CV and I say the last qualification was in 1995 or the year 2000, I worry. But you know what? Most importantly, I learn something about that person because they believe they know enough. They are satisfied. They are confident in their abilities. So when I see a lack 
of lifelong learning and professional development after a PhD, that's a proxy for me that this person thinks that they know it all. And none of us know it all. We don't even know some of it. <laughs> Think about how much the world has changed in the last two years. Wow, let alone the last 20 years. When I look at a CV and I'm thinking of employing somebody, I look at the lifelong learning, I look at the professional development a lot. And when I see lifelong learning, I go, right, okay, so this is a person who is porous to the ideas of others, listens, is open to challenge, open to change, is prepared to learn from different perspectives. So a learning life will also improve your working life because it changes your relationship with the world around you. And therefore, 10. Lifelong learning, why? Enforced reading <laughs> and enforced writing. Now we've discussed a lot self-motivation and self-learning through the vlog this week, but there's another reason to enact lifelong learning, particularly if you are busy. And people often ask me, like the wonderful Vanessa, why I've done all the coursework stuff. So why have I done extra degrees? Why have I done graduate diplomas? Why have I done coursework masters? Why haven't I done, oh my goodness me, a, another PhD? And there's really one clear answer to that. I like to learn from other people. I believe in expertise. So I love to learn from experts. Now for me, a coursework master's degree or any coursework qualification really is like entering a very posh smorgasbord because somebody's already spent all the time creating all these fantastic reading for me all these fantastic assessments and this is just great i just don't have to do anything i can just sit down and love it sit and engage with the world oh it's fantastic so i can learn about a new discipline a new idea from experts and when I have been incredibly busy in my life, these other degrees, these coursework degrees, have given me reading lists and provided me with writing tasks to do. So they enforce in a busy life that I read and that I write. So this means out of all the courses I've done, about 50 of my 250 plus articles and book chapters at this point, about 50 of them have had a relationship somewhere with one of these courses. And of all those quals I've done, probably four of my 20 books so far have come from the courses in some form. How fantastic is that? So if you need a bit of help, if you need a bit of scaffolding, then you know basically if you want a learning scaffold to organise your life, to give you deadlines, to give you requirements, then lifelong learning can do this for you. So thank you so much for being a part of this lifelong journey with me this week. And look, I hope there may be something here that you find resonant that might link to the lifelong journey for you. And look, it may be a second PhD. It may be a graduate certificate in education. It might be a MOOC. On Kindle publishing but if together we can create a culture of learning and reading and thinking rather than nonsense and opinion and talking and fake news that we may just change the world I wish you love light and peace Tia. <laughs>